Part five, chapter one of the life of Florence Nightingale, volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The life of Florence Nightingale, volume one, by Edward Tyus Cook. For the health of the army in India, eighteen sixty two to eighteen sixty five. The question is no less an one than this, how to create a public health department for India, how to bring a higher civilization into India. What a work, what a noble task for a government. No inglorious period of our dominion that, but a most glorious one. That would be creating India anew. For God places his own power, his own life-giving laws, in the hands of man. He permits man to create mankind by those laws, even as he permits man to destroy mankind by neglect of those laws. Florence Nightingale, How People May Live and Not Die in India, 1864. Chapter 1, Preliminary, The Loss of Friends. But tasks in hours of insight willed can be through hours of gloom fulfilled. Matthew Arnold the years immediately after Sidney Herbert's death were among the busiest and most useful in Miss Nightingale's life. She was engaged during them in carrying their joint work unfinished into a new field. In the previous volume, we saw Miss Nightingale using her position as the heroine of the Crimean War in order to become the founder of modern nursing and to initiate reforms for the welfare of the British soldier among those who know it is recognized that the services which she rendered to the british army at home were hardly greater than those which she was able to render to british india and it was this indian work which after sidney herbert's death became one of the main interests of her life she threw herself into it as we shall hear with full fire and brought to it abundant energy and resource but first she had the memory of her friend to honour and protect and then the hours of gloom were to be deepened by the loss of another friend hardly less dear to her having finished her paper upon sidney herbert miss nightingale left the burlington hotel never to return and took lodgings in hampstead august to october eighteen sixty one her mood was of deep despondency she was inclined to shut herself off from most of her former fellow-workers against the outside world she double-barred her shutters her uncle was strictly enjoined to give no one her address she asked that all her letters might be addressed to and from his care in london the formula was to be that a great and overwhelming affliction entirely precludes miss nightingale from seeing or writing to anybody for her sake it is most earnestly to be wished wrote her cousin beatrice to mr chadwick september eighteen that you may come into some immediate communication with her it is your faith that her working days are not yet over that she may work in another field her own being now closed against her i cannot find that any of those who have been with her lately would share this hope less on account of her health than of her state of extreme discouragement it was a case not only perhaps not chiefly of personal loss but also of public vexation it was not only that the minister had died it was that his work seemed like to die also the point of view appears in her letters to dr farr september ten we are grateful to you for the memorial of my dear master which you have raised to him in the hearts of the nation indeed it is in the hearts of the nation that he will live not in the hearts of ministers there he is dead already if indeed they have any and before he was cold in his grave gladstone attends his funeral and then writes to me that he cannot pledge himself to give any assistance in carrying out his friend's reforms the reign of intelligence at the war office is over the reign of muffs has begun the only rule of conduct in the bureaucracy there and in the horse guards is to reverse his decision his judgment and if they can do nothing more his words october two my poor master has been dead two months to-day 
too long a time for him not to be forgotten the dogs have trampled on his dead body alas seven years this month i have fought the good fight with the war office and lost it november two my dear master has been dead three months to-day poor lady herbert goes abroad this next week with the children and shuts up wilton the eldest boy going to school it is as if the earth had opened and swallowed up even the name which filled my whole life these five years but there were things to be done in her friend's name and she turned to do them the power of the bureaucracy to resist was strong because the new secretary of state was a novice at his task and lord herbert by failing to carry through any radical reorganization of the war office had as she said failed to put in the mainspring to his works the commander-in-chief rides over the learned secretary of state as if he were straw but there was one hopeful and helpful factor in the case now that the secretary for war was in the commons lord de grey was reappointed under secretary he was a genuine reformer he knew the mind of his former chief he was most sympathetic to lady herbert he was acquainted with miss nightingale the power of an under secretary is very small but what he could do he would a letter which she received from a friend both of lord de grey and of herself gave her encouragement r monckton milnes to miss nightingale october twenty one i knew how irreparable a loss you and your objects in life had in herbert's death but i should like you to know how you will find lord de grey willing to do all in his power to forward your great and wise designs i say in his power for that you know is extremely limited but he may do something for you in an indirect way and without much originality he has considerable tact and adroitness you won't like sir g lewis but somewhere or other you ought to do so for in his sincere way of looking at things and in his critical and curious spirit he is by no means unlike yourself he makes up his mind no doubt far better to the damnabilities of the work than you would do though one does not know what you would have been if you had been corrupted by public life i write this about de grey because i was staying with him not long ago and he expressed himself on the subject with much earnestness part two so then there were some things perhaps which might yet as she put it be saved from the wreck lord de grey had already given earnest both of his good will and of his courage he had seen lady herbert and asked about her husband's intentions she knew them generally but referred for details to miss nightingale who was thus able to be of some use in carrying through lord herbert's scheme for a soldier's home at aldershot then there was the question of the general hospital to be built at woolwich the commander-in-chief was opposed to the scheme and asked sir george lewis to cancel it economy was perhaps behind the minister tempting him but lord de grey who was present at the interview stood firm sir he said it is impossible lord herbert decided it and the house of commons voted it in the end the horse guards and the war office accepted the inevitable with a good grace the order was given for the building to proceed and miss nightingale's suggestion was adopted that it should be christened the herbert hospital lord de grey was also influential in securing a redefinition of captain galton's duties at the war office lady herbert told lord de grey that this was one of the last official matters on which she had heard her husband speak miss nightingale again supplied the details and to her ally was committed responsibility under the secretary of state for new barrack works on some other questions miss nightingale had the bitterness of seeing projects abandoned which she and lord herbert had almost matured it is really melancholy now wrote captain galton to her august nineteen to see the attempts made on all hands to pull down all that sidney herbert laboured to build up she recounted some of the disappointments in a letter to harriet martineau 
and that lady whose genuine sympathy in the cause was perhaps heightened by a journalist's scent for copy was eager to go on the war-path no harm can come she wrote to miss nightingale october four of an attempt to shame the horse guards i have consulted my editor of the daily news and if i can obtain a sufficiency of clear facts i will gladly harass the commander-in-chief as he was never harassed before that is i will write a leader against him every saturday for as many weeks as there are heads of accusation against him and his department we don't want to mince matters miss nightingale was to supply the powder and shot miss martineau was to fire the guns the partnership was declined by miss nightingale the reason she gave was that she was no longer in the way of obtaining much inside information but she doubtless had other reasons there were things which she had just managed to carry through there were other possibilities of usefulness before her she was playing a difficult game she did not think that her hand would be strengthened by newspaper polemics for the form of which she would not be responsible but the information in which would be traced back to her among the points which she had just managed to score was the appointment of the commission already mentioned for extending the barracks inquiry to the mediterranean stations headquarters tried to stop it and i defeated them she had told miss martineau september twenty four by a trick which they were too stupid to find out her papers do not disclose the nature of the trick by which this excellent piece of work was carried through and there was another thing which she did in order to forward sidney herbert's work though in a field outside that of their collaboration she wrote a stirring letter october eighth on the volunteer movement which he had organized in eighteen fifty nine it brought her several offers as we have heard already and displayed in large print on a card must have attracted many recruits she wrote it as one who had experience of war and its lessons as one too who had worked for the army seven years this very month without the intermission of one single waking hour she made eloquent appeal to the patriotic spirit of the british people and she included this piece of personal feeling on the saddest night of all my life two months ago when my dear chief sidney herbert lay dying and i knew that with him died much of the welfare of the british army he was too so proud so justly proud of his volunteers on that night i lay listening to the bands of the volunteers as they came marching in successively it had been a review day and i said to myself the nation can never go back which is capable of such a movement as this not the spirit of an hour these are men who have all something to give up all men whose time is valuable for money which is not their god as other nations say of us i do not know if the name of florence nightingale be still as it ought to be a name of power with the people if it is then her letter of eighteen sixty one might well be reprinted in connection with recruiting for the territorial force she laid stress upon the voluntary spirit as opposed to compulsion but she laid stress also on the supreme importance of efficient training garibaldi's volunteers did excellently in guerrilla movements they failed before a fourth-rate regular army end of part five chapter one preliminary the loss of friends part five chapter one of the life of florence nightingale volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the life of florence nightingale volume two by edward tyus cook preliminary the loss of friends continued part three presently some old work in a new form came in miss nightingale's way she had returned to london in november chiefly in order to be on the spot for consultation and suggestion in connection with the memorial to sidney herbert it was her suggestion for one thing that the memorial should include a prize medal at the army medical school 
for this sojourn in london sir harry verney lent his house in south street to miss nightingale the american civil war now kept her busy did i tell you she wrote to dr farr october eight that i had forwarded to the war secretary at washington upon application all our war office forms and reports statistical and other taking the occasion to tell them that as the u s had adopted our registrar-general's nomenclature it would be easier for them to adopt our army statistics forms it appears that they the northern states are quite puzzled by their own want of any army organization i also took occasion to tell them of our chinese success in reducing the army mortality to one-tenth of what it was and the constantly sick to one-seventh of what they were during the first winter of the crimean war due to my dear master when the civil war broke out miss nightingale's example in the crimea had produced an immediate effect a woman's central association of relief was formed in new york in cooperation with other bodies they petitioned the secretary of war to appoint a sanitary commission and after some delay this was done camps were inspected female nurses were sent to the hospitals contrivances for improved cooking were supplied and in short much of miss nightingale's crimean work was reproduced presently she became more directly concerned at the end of the year eighteen sixty one england was on the verge of being embroiled in the conflict and whilst the agitation over the trent affair was at its height the british government decided to send reinforcements to canada lord de grey was charged with many of the preparations he asked miss nightingale december three if he might consult her personally as to sanitary arrangements generally he wished to profit by her experience and judgment in relation to transports hospitals clothing of the troops supplies comforts for the sick and generally upon the defects and dangers to be feared and how best to prevent them he also asked for the names of suitable men for the position of principal medical officer and he consulted her again before making the appointment without a moment's loss of time she set to work in conjunction with dr sutherland and sent in her suggestions the draft instructions to the officers in charge of the expedition were sent to her on december eight on december ten lord de grey wrote i have got all your suggestions inserted in the instructions and am greatly obliged to you for them we are shipping off the expedition to canada as fast as we can she wrote to madame mole december thirteenth i have been working just as i did in the times of sidney herbert alas he left no organization my dear master but the horse guards were so terrified at the idea of the national indignation if they lost another army that they have consented to everything a few days later another draft of instructions was sent to her through captain galton we have gone over your draft very carefully she wrote december eighteen and find that although it includes almost everything necessary it does not define with sufficient precision the manner in which the meat is to get from the commissariat into the soldier's kettle or the clothing from the army medical general store on to the soldier's back you must define all this otherwise you will have men as you had in the crimea shirking the responsibility memoranda among miss nightingale's papers show the grasp of detail with which she worked out the problems her mind envisaged the scene of operations she calculated the distances which might have to be covered by sledges she counted the relays and depots she compared the relative weights and warming capacities of blankets and buffalo robes a great commander was lost to her country when florence nightingale was born a woman her suggestions in the case of the canadian reinforcements were happily not put to the test of war the trent affair was smoothed over largely as is now well known owing to the moderating counsels of the prince consort it was his last service to his adopted country miss nightingale felt his death to be a national loss he neither liked she said of him nor was liked but what he has done for our country no one knows part four 
miss nightingale's work in connection with the canadian expedition was done in the midst of a personal sorrow of her own second only in poignancy if second at all to that caused by the death of sidney herbert this was the death of arthur hugh clough he had broken down in health and been ordered abroad in april eighteen sixty one and she had urged him to go he died however at florence on november twelve they had been close friends since her return to england from the crimea his sweetness of disposition his humour his lofty moral feeling alike attracted her he on his side had deep admiration for her and he devoted such strength alas but little as remained to him from work in the privy council office to her service he fetched and carried for her he made arrangements for her journeys as we have heard and escorted her he saw her printers he corrected her proofs he became at a modest salary secretary to the nightingale fund it was poor work to set a poet to but he did it with cheerful modesty he was intent he told miss nightingale upon doing plain work he had studied and taught he said too much for a man's own moral good in eighteen sixty his health began to fail miss nightingale was sometimes a little impatient his loyalty and zeal she could never have doubted but she was inclined to think him lacking in initiative and energy she was always inclined to drive willing horses a little hardly in the case of clough as in that of sidney herbert she sometimes attributed to infirmity of will what was in fact due to infirmity of body and in each case her grief when the end came was not free i think from some element of self-reproach i have always felt she had written to her uncle december seventh eighteen sixty that i had been a great drag on arthur's health and spirits a much greater one than i should have chosen to be if i had not promised him to die sooner she saw my father wrote her cousin beatrice to mr nightingale december four to speak only of arthur as only she can speak she was quite natural very affectionate very very much moved but in her state of loneliness and nervous exhaustion her feeling for lost friends was sometimes morbid she said that for months after the death of sidney herbert and again after that of clough she could not bear to open a newspaper for dread of seeing some mention of a beloved name some years later she was sent a book by mrs clough i like very much she replied november thirteenth eighteen sixty five how much i cannot say to receive that book from you but it would be impossible to me to read it or look at it not from want of time or strength but from too much of both spent on his memory from thinking not too little but too much on him but i don't say this for others i believe it is a morbid peculiarity of long illness of the loss of power of resistance to morbid thoughts i cannot bear to see a portrait of those who are gone the depth of her grief at the death of mr clough is expressed or reflected in letters which she wrote or received at the time benjamin jowett to miss nightingale balliol november nineteen eighteen sixty one thank you for writing to me i am very much grieved at the tidings which your letter brought me i agree entirely in your estimate of our dear friend's character it was in eighteen thirty six the anniversaries next week that i first saw him when he was elected to the balliol scholarship no one who only knew him in later life would imagine what a noble striking-looking youth he was before he got worried with false views of religion and the world i never met with any one who was more thoroughly high-minded i believe he acted all through life simply from the feeling of what was right he certainly had great genius but some want of will or some want of harmony with things around him prevented his creating anything worthy of himself i am glad he was married life was dark to him and his wife and children made him as happy as he was capable of being made he was naturally very religious and i think that he never recovered the rude shock which his religion received during his first years at oxford he did not see and yet he believed in the great belief of all to do rightly did i quote to you ever an expression which neander used to me of blanco white einer christ mehr in uber wust sein als in bewut sein it grieves me that you should have lost so invaluable a friend no earthly trial can be greater than to pursue without friends the work that you began with them and yet it is the more needed because it rests on one only 
if there be any way in this world to be like christ it must be by pursuing in solitude and illness without the support of sympathy or public opinion works for the good of mankind i hope you will sometimes let me hear from you let me assure you that i shall never cease to take an interest in your objects and writings ever yours sincerely b jowett miss nightingale to sir john mcneill south street november eighteenth he was a man of rare mind and temper the more so because he would gladly do plain work to me seeing the blundering harasses which were the uses to which we put him he seemed like a racehorse harnessed to a coal truck this not because he did plain work and did it so well for the best of us can be put to no better use than that he helped me immensely though not officially by his sound judgment and constant sympathy o oh, jonathan my brother jonathan my love to thee was very great passing the love of woman now not one man remains that i can call a man of all those whom these five years i have worked with but as you say we are all dying sir john mcneill to miss nightingale edinburgh november nineteen i should find it difficult to tell you how much your letter has distressed me i do not know that i have ever cared so much for any man of whom i had seen so little perhaps it may not have been all on his own account for to know that he was near you was a comfort but if he had not been altogether estimable in head and heart this mixed feeling could not have arisen his death leaves you dreadfully alone in the midst of your work but that work is your life and you can do it alone there is no feeling more sustaining than that of being alone at least i have ever found it so to mount my horse and ride over the desert alone with the sky closing the circle in which my horse and i were the only living things i have always found intensely elating to work out views in which no one helped me has all my life been to me a source of vitality and strength so i doubt not it will be to you for you have a strength and a power for good to which i never could pretend it is a small matter to die a few days sooner than usual it is a great matter to work while it is day and so to husband one's power as to make the most of the days that are given us this you will do herbert and clough and many more may fall around you but you are destined to do a great work and you cannot die till it is substantially if not apparently done you are leaving your impress on the age in which you live and the print of your foot will be traced by generations yet unborn go on to you the accidents of mortality ought to be as the falling of the leaves in autumn ever respectfully and sincerely yours john mcneill miss nightingale was able as her friends predicted to pursue in hours of gloom the tasks which in hours of insight she had willed and to continue without the same sympathy from close friends as before the kind of work which she had once done with sidney herbert's co-operation or with clough's advice but she yearned for sympathy none the less in a noble though an exacting way for by sympathy she understood not such feeling as would be expressed merely in affectionate behaviour or personal consideration for herself but a fellow-feeling for her objects expressed in readiness to follow her in serving them with something of her own practical devotion she did not think of herself apart from her mission miss nightingale to madame mole thirty two south street london december thirteenth eighteen sixty one i have read half your book through madame Racamier, and am immensely charmed by it but some things i disagree with and more i do not understand this does not apply to the characters but to your conclusions for example you say women are more sympathetic than men now if i were to write a book out of my experience i should begin women have no sympathy yours is the tradition mine is the conviction of experience i have never found one woman who has altered her life by one iota for me or my opinions now look at my experience of men a statesman past middle age absorbed in politics for a quarter of a century out of sympathy with me remodels his whole life and policy learns a science the driest the most technical the most difficult that of administration as far as it concerns the lives of men not as i learnt it in the field from stirring experience but by writing dry regulations in a london room by my sofa with me this is what i call real sympathy another alexander whom i made director-general does very nearly the same thing he is dead too clough a poet born if ever there was one takes to nursing administration in the same way for me i only mentioned three whose whole lives were remodelled by sympathy for me but i could mention very many others farr mcneill tullock storks martin who in a lesser degree have altered their work by my opinions 
and the most wonderful of all a man born without a soul like undine all these elderly men now just look at the degree in which women have sympathy as far as my experience is concerned and my experience of women is almost as large as europe and it is so intimate too i have lived and slept in the same bed with english countesses and prussian bowerinnen no roman catholic superior has ever had charge of women of the different creeds that i have had no woman has excited passions among women more than i have yet i leave no school behind me my doctrines have taken no hold among women not one of my crimean following learnt anything from me or gave herself for one moment after she came home to carry out the lesson of that war or of those hospitals no woman that i know has ever appris à apprendre and i attribute this to want of sympathy you say somewhere that women have no attention yes and i attribute this to want of sympathy nothing makes me so impatient as people complaining of their want of memory how can you remember what you have never heard it makes me mad the women's rights talk about the want of a field for them when i know that i would gladly give five hundred pounds a year for a woman secretary and two english lady superintendents have told me the same thing and we can't get one they don't know the names of the cabinet ministers they don't know the offices at the horse guards they don't know who of the men of the day is dead and who is alive they don't know which of the churches has bishops and which not now i am sure i did not know these things when i went to the crimea i did not know a colonel from a corporal but there are such things as army lists and our almanacs yet i never could find a woman who out of sympathy would consult one for my work the only woman i ever influenced by sympathy was one of those lady superintendents i have named yet she is like me overwhelmed with her own business in one sense i do believe i am like a man as partha says but how in having sympathy i am sure i have nothing else i am sure i have no genius i am sure that my contemporaries partha hilary marianne lady dunsany were all cleverer than i was and several of them more unselfish but not one had a bit of sympathy now sidney herbert's wife just did the secretary's work for her husband which i have had to do without out of pure sympathy she did not understand his policy yet she could write his letters for him like a man i should think madame le Camier was another specimen of pure sympathy women crave for being loved not for loving they scream out at you for sympathy all day long they are incapable of giving any in return for they cannot remember your affairs long enough to do so they cannot state a fact accurately to another nor can that other attend to it accurately enough for it to become information now is not all this the result of want of sympathy you say of madame recamier that her existence was empty but brilliant and you attribute it to want of family oh dear friend don't give in to that sort of tradition people often say to me you don't know what a wife and mother feels no i say i don't and i'm very glad i don't and they don't know what i feel i am sick with indignation at what wives and mothers will do of the most egregious selfishness and people call it all maternal or conjugal affection and think it pretty to say so no no let each person tell the truth from his own experience ezekiel went running about naked for a sign i can't run about naked because it is not the custom of the country but i would mount three widows caps on my head for a sign and i would cry this is for sidney herbert this is for arthur clough and this the biggest widow's cap of all is for the loss of all sympathy on the part of my dearest and nearest i cannot understand how madame recamier could give advice and sympathy to such opposite people as for example madame salvage and chateaubriand neither can i understand how she could give support without recommending a, a distinct line of policy by merely keeping up the tone to a high one it is as if i had said to sidney herbert be a statesman be a statesman instead of indicating to him a definite course of statesmanship to follow also i am sure i never could have given advice and sympathy to gladstone and s herbert men pursuing opposite lines of policy also i am sure i never could have been the friend and adviser of sidney herbert of alexander and of others by simply keeping up the tone of general conversation on promiscuous matters we debated and settled measures together that is the way we did it adieu my friend i have had two consultations they say that all this worry has brought on congestion of the spine which leads straight to paralysis 
miss nightingale to her mother nine chesterfield street west march seventh eighteen sixty two dearest mother so far from your letters being a bore you are the only person who tells me any news i have never been able to get over the morbid feeling at seeing my lost twos names in the paper so that i see no paper i did not know of the deaths you mentioned but they and others do not know how much they are spared by having no bitterness mingled with their grief such unspeakable bitterness has been connected with each one of my losses far far greater than the grief sometimes i wonder that i should be so impatient for death had i only to stand and wait i think it would be nothing though the pain is so great that i wonder how anybody can dread an operation i think what i have felt most during my last three months of extreme weakness is the not having one single person to give me one inspiring word or even one correct fact i am glad to end a day which never can come back gladder to end a night gladdest to end a month i have felt this much more in, in setting up for the first time in my life a fashionable old maid's house in a fashionable quarter though grateful to papa's liberality for enabling me to do so because it is as it were deciding upon a new and independent course in my broken old age thank you very much for the weekly box i could not help sending the game chicken vegetables and flowers to king's college hospital i never see the spring without thinking of my clough he used to tell me how the leaves were coming out always remembering that without his eyes i should never see the spring again thank god my loss too are in brighter springs than ours poor mrs herbert told me that her chief comfort was in a little chinese dog of his which he was not very fond of either he always said he liked christians better than beasts but which used to come and kiss her eyelids and lick the tears from her cheeks i remember thinking this childish but now i don't my cat does just the same to me dumb beasts observe you so much more than talking beings and know so much better what you are thinking of ever dear mamma your loving child f at the turn of the year eighteen sixty one sixty two miss nightingale had been very ill and two physicians dr williams and dr sutherland were in daily attendance happily however the case was by no means so serious as she had reported to madame mole and in eighteen sixty two she was able to devote unremitting labour to one of the heaviest and most useful pieces of work which she ever did End of preliminary the loss of loved ones continued part five chapter two of the life of florence nightingale volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the life of florence nightingale volume two by edward tyus cook the providence of the indian army eighteen sixty two eighteen sixty three in this case you are doing much more than providing for the health of the troops for to be effectual the improvement must extend to the civil population and thus another great element of civilization will be introduced sir charles trevelyan letter to florence nightingale august eleventh eighteen sixty two it is a commonplace that the british empire in india was won and is held by british arms and this though not the whole truth of the tenure by which the empire is held is true what is also true but less generally known is that there have been heavier sacrifices than those demanded in war and rendered glorious by british valour the greater part of the british lives that were shed in india were lost not in battle but by disease burke said of british rule in india in his time england has built no bridges made no high roads cut no navigations were we driven out of india this day nothing would remain to tell that it had been possessed during the inglorious period of our dominion by anything better than the orangutan or the tiger that was no longer true at the time with which we are here concerned the era had begun in which it has been a song of the english to drive the road and bridge the ford but the land was not yet cleared of evil the british soldier was still sent out to india to die ingloriously by the neglect of sanitary laws in eighteen fifty nine it was found that the average annual death rate among the british soldiers in india since the year eighteen seventeen 
had been sixty nine per one thousand today it is little over five per one thousand the changes in barracks and military sanitation in india which are primarily accountable for this great saving of life are directly traceable to the recommendations of the royal commission which was appointed by lord stanley in eighteen fifty nine and which reported in eighteen sixty three thus much the reader may find stated in any trustworthy book of reference or other standard authority what he will not find generally stated is that the appointment of the royal commission is directly traceable to miss nightingale that by her the greater part of its report was written and that the suggestions for reform founded upon it were also her work at an international congress held in london in eighteen sixty a french delegate as already related spoke of florence nightingale as the providence of the english army she was no less the providence of the indian army to the british soldier in india as at home she was a saviour in introducing this subject we must go back a little in point of time for the indian work had begun a few years before the death of sidney herbert i must tell you a secret wrote miss nightingale to harriet martineau in eighteen fifty nine may nineteen because i think it will please you for eight long months i have been importunate widowing my unjust judge viz lord stanley to give us a royal sanitary commission to do exactly the same thing for the armies in india which the last did for the army at home we have just won it the queen has signed the warrant so it is safe mr sidney herbert is chairman of course dr sutherland martin farr and alexander whose names will be known to you and sir r vivian and sir p cautley of the india council are on it miss nightingale had made up her mind two years before to do this thing the indian mutiny which filled some minds only with thoughts of vengeance and repression against the native soldiers filled hers rather with thoughts of pity and reform on behalf of the british soldiers she had gone into the figures of mortality in the indian army at the time when she was analyzing those in the army at home there was murder committed not only by the sepoys it was murder also to doom british soldiers to death by neglect of sanitary precautions at the end of her notes on the army eighteen fifty seven she inserted a fly-leaf which foreshadowed her indian campaign while the sheets were passing through the press those lamentable occurrences took place in india which have led to an universal conviction that this vast empire must henceforth be held by british troops if we were to be led by past experience of the presumed effect of indian climates on european constitutions our country might almost despair of being able to supply men enough the british race has carried with it into those regions of the sun its habits its customs and its vices without considering that under a low temperature man may do with impunity what under a higher one is death our vast indian empire consists of many zones of many regions of many climates on the mere question of climate it is surely within human possibility even in the great majority of instances so to arrange the stations and so to connect them by railroads and telegraphs that the troops would hardly be required to occupy unhealthy districts even with regard to such districts the question arises to what extent the unhealthiness is inevitable and to what extent it would be remediable as an illustration of the necessity of government interference in this matter it may be stated on the very first authority that after a campaign perhaps one of the most arduous and successful on record and when the smallness of the british force in the season of the year required every sanitary precaution to be taken for the preservation of the force a certain earnest energetic officer appointed a sanitary inspector to attend to the cleansing of a captured city and to the burial of some thousand dead bodies of men horses asses bullocks camels and elephants which were poisoning the air 
the bombay government to which the appointment was referred would not sanction it because there was no precedent for it in future it ought to be the duty of the indian government to require no precedents for such procedure the observance of sanitary laws should be as much part of the future regime of india as the holding of military positions or as civil government itself it would be a noble beginning of the new order of things to use hygiene as the handmaid of civilization everything that miss nightingale thus said should be done was done and to the doing of it she supplied first the propelling force and then much of the detailed direction first came the movement for getting the appointment of a royal commission agreed to in principle miss nightingale's reference to lord stanley as her unjust judge need not be taken too seriously he was her very good friend as we know and it was when he was transferred from the colonial to the india office eighteen fifty eight that she felt her time to have come and lord stanley agreed at once to her suggestion of appointing a commission it was when the consideration of the commission was reached that the delay began who should approach lord stanley on the details and how should it be done miss nightingale and what i have called her cabinet of reformers were equally interested in the sub-commission still sitting on army sanitation at home lord stanley wanted mr herbert to undertake the chairmanship of the india commission should he accept it at risk of diverting some of his attention from these other reforms miss nightingale and her friends hit upon a plan as she hoped for killing two birds with one stone it was intimated to lord stanley that mr herbert would accept the chairmanship on condition that the pending reforms at home were hastened i do not know if the indian secretary came to terms with the war secretary in that sense if he did i fear that general peel interpreted haste as festina lante anyhow mr herbert accepted the chairmanship and then some months were spent in arranging the membership and the terms of reference there were to be three sanitary experts a statistician and two members of the india council of the two latter one sir r vivian was a friend of miss nightingale's uncle mr smith and of sir proby cautley she had heard good reports the sanitarians dr sutherland martin and alexander and dr farr the statistician were all of her inner circle at the last moment there was a fresh delay the list was submitted for the royal approval and her majesty required that a queen's officer of acknowledged experience in india should be added to the commission mr herbert asked miss nightingale to supply a suitable man by which he meant a man whose acknowledged experience included some belief in sanitary science she took great pains and employed some while in obtaining the best opinions she wrote for one thing to her uncle telling him may nineteenth eighteen fifty nine to get at sir john lawrence through his friend sir r vivian and ask for suggestions vivian must be soaked she added so as not to let him think that we undervalue his opinion sir john lawrence did not however on this occasion prove very resourceful miss nightingale sent in the name of an officer colonel e h greathead who had been commended to her through another channel and he was duly added to the commission at an earlier stage she had thrown out the interesting suggestion that john stuart mill lately retired from the east india house should be asked to serve but this did not meet with favour our business wrote one of her circle is with spades and wheelbarrows and he doubted whether compte could be put to such purposes miss nightingale always thought that this ally of hers though invaluable in many ways was a little wanting in soul so then the commission was appointed the warrant was issued on may thirty one eighteen fifty nine the commission reported on may nineteenth eighteen sixty three there were some changes in its personnel from death and other causes on the overthrow of the derby government mr herbert went to the war office and he presently resigned the chairmanship lord stanley succeeded him 
the members of the commission on whom both mr herbert and lord stanley most relied were dr sutherland and dr farr and a third who was yet not a member miss nightingale and among these three the lion's share of the work was done by her part two she had not waited for the actual appointment of the commission to begin collecting preparing and digesting evidence for it her first concern was to draft a circular of inquiry which should be sent to all the stations in india it lacked nothing as will be supposed in requiring fullness of statistical detail when she had prepared it she sent it in proof to sir john mcneill for his suggestions asking him also may ninth eighteen fifty nine kindly to give an opinion as to the general direction which the inquiry should take in cases where she was personally acquainted with governors or high military or medical officers in india she wrote soliciting their good offices sir charles trevelyan then governor of madras promised cordial cooperation. then she and dr farr set to work on such statistical records as were obtainable from the east india house there is a bundle of correspondence amongst her papers relating to the difficulties she encountered and surmounted in obtaining official sanction for clerical work in this regard dr farr's appetite for statistics was as insatiable as hers and she had taken means to lay in ample supplies miss nightingale to dr farr highgate june two eighteen fifty nine your commission was gazetted on may thirty one and mr herbert is in town as it will be necessary to obtain the statistics of sickness mortality and invaliding of the indian army from the medical boards there would not some of the proposed forms for the army medical department be better than any other filled up for each station with the diseases annually for a period say of ten years or would it be necessary to provide others we must of course have the most minute statistics both for soldiers and officers in the queen's companies and native troops and these we should get by this method for ten years i suppose the medical boards have the presidency medical book records would it be necessary to get the returns for each corps separately would it not be important to get the ages age and time of service at death or invaliding hampstead december sixth eighteen fifty nine in consequence of your intemperate desire to have the indian medical service regulations we have applied at the great house for copies and the answer is that they have only one office copy and if we want any we must send to india knowing their weakness we had in our queries previously sent two two hundred stations in india for copies of all regulations and we hope the result will satisfy your literary appetite dr farr then was being fed with statistics officials in india were being kept busy with forms to be filled up and with the preparation of other written evidence in november eighteen fifty nine the commission began taking oral evidence in london but this was a comparatively minor part of its labours and during eighteen sixty no public sittings were held they were resumed in eighteen sixty one lord stanley had then succeeded mr herbert in the chair but miss nightingale's grip upon the commission was not relaxed two of the commissioners dr sutherland and dr farr were in close touch with her the former was with her almost every day the latter asked her to send him questions which he should put to witnesses as in the case of the former royal commission so now miss nightingale saw some of the witnesses before they gave their evidence among her visitors in this sort was sir john lawrence as already mentioned and a friendship began which had important consequences seeing that everything was thus in good train miss nightingale was able during the years eighteen fifty nine sixty sixty one to devote her main work to those other matters with which we have been concerned in preceding parts in eighteen sixty two her main interest was in the indian commission and the amount of work which she gave to it during eighteen sixty two to eighteen sixty three was enormous her manner of life during these years was similar to that described in a previous chapter 
work for the commission required her constant attendance in london or within easy distance of it in eighteen sixty two she lived either in a hotel peary's thirty one dover street a hired house nine chesterfield street or sir harry verney's house in south street during august and september she took a house in oak hill park hampstead in eighteen sixty three she divided her time between hampstead hired houses in cleveland row and sir harry verney's her affectionate friend mrs sutherland did all the house hunting for her cleveland row was selected for its nearness to the war office and the convenience of the site so far constrained dr sutherland's sanitary conscience that he declared cleveland row to be the airiest place in london part three few of my readers have come to close quarters i suppose with the indian sanitary commission's report it is a very formidable thing consisting of two bulky volumes containing respectively one thousand sixty nine and nine hundred and fifty nine pages in all two thousand twenty eight pages mostly in small print of this mountainous mass the greater part bears in one way or another the impress of miss nightingale it was she in the first place as already stated who drafted the questions which were sent to every military station in india the replies signed in each case by the commanding officer the engineer officer and the medical officer occupy the whole of the second volume the replies as they came in from india were sent to her to analyze there were van loads of them she said which cost her four pounds ten shillings to move whenever she changed houses with the analysis made by her and dr sutherland these replies anticipated as she afterwards noted the statistical survey of india which lord mayo ordered ten years later it was said at the time that such a complete picture of life in india both british and native was contained in no other book in existence in october eighteen sixty one she was formally requested by the commission to submit remarks on these stational reports she had completed the task by august eighteen sixty two the observations by miss nightingale which occupy twenty three pages of the report are among the most remarkable of her works and in their results among the most beneficent they are also extremely readable and to make them more instructive she included a number of woodcuts illustrating not only indian hospitals and barracks but native customs in connection with water supply and drainage the treasury horrified perhaps at the idea of popularizing a blue book made some demur to the cost but miss nightingale was allowed to solve the difficulty by paying for the printing as well as for the illustrations out of her private purse she made full use of the opening which the niggardliness of the treasury gave her she hurried the printers and had a large number of her observations struck off for private use i have looked once more wrote lord stanley november twenty one through your remarks and like them better the oftener i read them the style alone apart from the authority which your name carries with it will ensure their being studied by many who know nothing of the subject they will admirably relieve the dryness of our official report i hope every indian and english newspaper will reprint them in extracts at least they must be circulated with our report separately from the too voluminous mass of evidence which we can't help appending you have added one more to your many and invaluable services in the cause miss nightingale's paper wrote dr farr to dr sutherland december one is a masterpiece in her best style and will rile the enemy very considerable all for his good poor creature but it was not only among the commissioners that she circulated her paper she sent it confidentially to many of her influential friends the picture is terrible wrote sir john mcneill august nine but it is all true there is no one statement from beginning to end that i feel disposed to question and there are many which my own observation and experience enable me to confirm a copy went to john stuart mill who was much pleased with the observations and was certain that the publication of them would do vast good 
miss nightingale had a copy bound for the queen and sent it as also a copy of her paper on sidney herbert through sir james clark who marked passages for the queen to read her majesty he found from conversation had not confined her reading to those passages the queen in return sent a copy of her collection of prince albert's speeches the queen wrote miss nightingale to monsieur mole february fourteenth eighteen sixty three has sent me her book with such a touching inscription she always reminds me of the greek chorus with her hands clasped above her head wailing out her irrepressible despair miss nightingale sent her observations also to sir john lawrence who studied them closely and corresponded with her on the subject another copy went to sir charles trevelyan having he wrote october thirty one eighteen sixty two undertaken the duties of financial member of the council of india i may now be able to give some help in carrying the recommendations of your commission into practical effect you must not expect from me as much as sidney herbert did for my power will not be the same the governor-general and the local governors will alone be in that position but i shall do what i can perhaps you will send me a copy of your abstract of the evidence and direct my attention to the points of more immediate importance i shall be obliged for any hints miss nightingale responded by sending him papers enough to occupy all his time on the voyage she seems at this time to have entertained some hope that her health would permit her when the report was out to visit india in person for one of sir charles's letters refers to such a visit and expresses the pleasure which it would give to lady trevelyan and himself to receive her as their guest and in every way to assist her mission but this was not to be her knowledge of india and indian questions was already great and presently it became so minute as to encourage a legend that she herself had once been there but she never saw the country it is not always either the lifelong resident or on the other hand paget m p who is better qualified than the student to perceive and serve a country's need miss nightingale's observations form a synopsis of the whole subject giving chapter and verse from the stational reports for each of her statements she shows first that the prevailing diseases were camp diseases such as she had seen in the crimean war largely due to the selection of unsuitable sites among the causes were bad water bad drainage filthy bazaars want of ventilation and surface overcrowding in barrack huts and sick wards her remarks under these several heads are often characteristically racy where tests have been used the composition of the water reads like a very intricate prescription containing nearly all the chlorides sulphates nitrates and carbonates in the pharmacopoeia besides silica and quantities of animal and vegetable matter which the reports apparently consider nutritive if the facilities for washing were as great as those for drink our indian army would be the cleanest body of men in the world there is no drainage in any sense in which we understand the word the reports speak of cesspits as if they were dressing-rooms except where the two lawrences have been there one can always recognize their traces the bazaars are simply in the first savage stage of social savage life under the head of overcrowding she brings together various instances with figures and woodcuts she quotes one report which said that the men three hundred men per room are generally accommodated in the barrack without inconvenient overcrowding and she asks what is convenient overcrowding at some stations the floors are of earth varnished over periodically with cow dung a practice borrowed from the natives like mahomet and the mountain if men won't go to the dunghill the dunghill it appears comes to them her next section on intemperance is scathing in india as at home it was a current opinion of the time that the soldier is by nature a drunken animal the only question seemed to be as to how he had better get drunk 
at one station though the men were reported as mostly temperate she found that on a ten years average one man in three was admitted into hospital directly from drink the men are killed by liver disease on canteen spirits to save them from being killed by liver disease on bazaar spirits may there not be some middle course whereby the men may be killed by neither under diet she notes the absurdity of a uniform ration in amount and quality in all seasons and climates and ventures to doubt whether cesspits are desirable adjuncts of kitchens her next head is want of occupation and exercise a fruitful source of vice and disease it is a most interesting chapter full of valuable hints and illustrated by an amusing drawing sent to her by colonel young of daily means of occupation and amusement passim here as in much else of miss nightingale's work she collected all the better opinions she picked out from the returns before her any hopeful experiments enlarged upon them and drove the moral home her chapter on indian hospitals is naturally very full and detailed she discusses the prevalent structural defects suggests improvements in the internal arrangements and notes that there were neither trained orderlies nor female nurses on the subject of hill stations miss nightingale's observations show a fear lest too much reliance should be placed upon their superior salubrity she quotes instances of terrible sanitary defects on hill stations and enforces the moral that the salvation of the indian army must be brought about by sanitary measures everywhere after discussing native towns soldiers wives and statistics miss nightingale insisted generally on the importance of instituting a proper system of sanitary service in india henceforth to the end almost of her long life she regarded herself and in large measure was able to act as a sanitary servant to the army and peoples of india miss nightingale's observations were only part of her share in the labours of the commission they were followed in the report by an abstract arranged under presidencies of the returns on which the observations were founded this analysis occupying nearly a hundred pages was drawn up as already stated by miss nightingale and dr sutherland the manuscript of it preserved amongst her papers is mainly in her handwriting and she did much more as will presently be related end of the providence of the indian army sections one two and three part five chapter two of the life of florence nightingale volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the life of florence nightingale volume two by edward tyus cook the providence of the indian army continued part four when the commission of the army in india was nearing the end of its labours an event happened which seemed to miss nightingale of crucial importance on april fourteenth eighteen sixty three she heard from sir harry verney that sir george lewis the secretary for war had died suddenly on the previous day sir harry added that at the service clubs lord de grey was talked of as a probable successor but that lord panmure's name was also mentioned from another and a better informed source she heard that lord de grey hoped to get the appointment but that there were believed to be two difficulties in the way the queen might object to the war office being given to a minister who had not yet been in the cabinet and pressure might be put upon lord palmerston from other quarters not to appoint a peer should either or both of these factors prevail mr cardwell was believed to be the most probable successor 
now it seemed to miss nightingale all important that when the report on the health of the army in india came out the secretary of state for war should be a proved sanitarian she did not want to have once more to bully the bison and she did not know much of mr cardwell she did know lord de grey and she knew him as a sympathizer in her cause without a moment's delay she set herself to bring to bear in his favour such influence as she might possess either on her own account or as the public legatee as it were of sidney herbert a telegram written on clare and preserved by the recipient shows how a good press was secured for lord de grey's appointment from florence nightingale to harriet martineau agitate agitate for lord de grey to succeed sir george lewis the world was duly informed next day april seventeenth through the columns of the daily news that public opinion expected the appointment of lord de grey but miss nightingale took other measures she wrote a letter to lord palmerston and to his principal colleague mr gladstone she sent a copy of it mr gladstone in reply did not doubt that lord palmerston had a very high opinion of lord de grey but added on his own part that he saw great difficulty in not having the head of the war office with its vast expenditure in the house of commons the letter to lord palmerston meanwhile was delivered by a special messenger who had been strictly charged to make sure that the minister read it at once the sequel describing a somewhat curious scene had better be given in sir harry verney's own words cleveland row april fifteenth two thirty from hampstead i returned to south street and found your letter thence to cambridge house lord palmerston was so good as to admit me i said that i had seen you this morning and that by your desire i requested him to allow me to read a letter to him from you he said certainly and i read it to him rather slowly having read it i said that you had mentioned this morning that within a fortnight of lord herbert's death he had said to you more than once that he hoped lord de grey might be his successor i then added i have not to request any reply or observations on miss nightingale's letter i have only to thank you for your kindness in allowing me to read it he took the letter and put it in his pocket he then asked how you are and where and i told him there is a cabinet at five thirty this afternoon i think that if gladstone has your note before going to it it might be well she had anticipated sir harry's suggestion as we have seen the prime minister put her letter into his pocket but it did not stay there he took it with him to windsor and read it to the queen on april twenty two it was announced that her majesty had been pleased to approve the appointment of lord de grey as secretary of state for war part five miss nightingale thus felt assured that when the indian report came out she would have a sympathetic chief at the war office and she turned with the greater zest to the next stage in her labours namely the preparation of the report by the commissioners the manuscript of the first page or two explaining the delay in issuing the report and the procedure of the commission is in lord stanley's handwriting preserved among miss nightingale's papers he entrusted the preparation of the first draft of the rest of the report for statistics to dr farr and for the rest to miss nightingale and dr sutherland she had written a first draft of the greater part of her sections of the report as early as april eighteen sixty two by august it was in type and corrected by lord stanley who pledged himself to carry it through the commission next month but dr farr's section was not so far advanced and there were other delays at which miss nightingale chafed not a little in may eighteen sixty three the last stage was reached i have done and shall do all in my power lord stanley wrote to her july ten to make it public that to dr sutherland and you we mainly owe it that the report has assumed its present shape among her papers is a collection of proofs of the report in various stages some corrected by dr farr and dr sutherland others corrected and recorrected by her the descriptive portion of the report is in substance a repetition of her observations in the colder language which is held to add weight and dignity to such documents 
though here and there miss nightingale's touch may be felt the magnitude of the evils which needed to be remedied is put in an arresting way besides deaths from natural causes nine per one thousand sixty head per one thousand of our troops perish annually in india it is at that expense that we have held dominion there for a century a company out of every regiment has been sacrificed every twenty months these companies fade away in the prime of life leave few children and have to be replaced at great cost by successive shiploads of recruits the cost of preventable sickness in the indian army was calculated at three hundred and eighty eight thousand pounds a year the list of recommendations with which the report concludes may be described as a sanitary charter for the army in india a charter which during many successive years was gradually put into force last of all came what miss nightingale considered the most vital point of all namely the suggestion of practical machinery by which if the government adopted it the recommendations of the commission might be carried out at this crucial point she had a very stiff fight the machinery as she had devised it was to be twofold first there were to be sanitary commissions appointed for each presidency in india on this point all the commissioners seemed to have been agreed but it was different with miss nightingale's second point the reports which she had read and marked from the indian stations filled her with a fear that if the whole of the initiative were left to india the work would in some cases be negligently or unintelligently done there had not yet been in that country the same education of public opinion amongst the governing class in the science of sanitation that had been in progress in england she deemed it essential that the machinery recommended by the commission should in one way or another include provision to secure for india the experience already obtained in dealing with all kinds of sanitary questions in england she had formulated her own plans to this end at an early stage of the commission what she first suggested was a sanitary department at the india office and this as we shall hear in a later chapter was ultimately established it had been well if the suggestion had been accepted from the beginning for the compromise which was substituted led to some confused friction between the war office and the india office as the second best plan miss nightingale wanted the standing sanitary committee at the war office reinforced by one or two representatives of india to be invested with authority over indian sanitation and she wanted secondly a sanitary code to be issued for india by the home government she had named the two indian officials and had urged the addition of mr rawlinson at that time the leading sanitary engineer in england but on all this there was some difference of opinion she was kept informed from day to day of the currents of thought among the commissioners and of course of the discussions the letters minutes memoranda in which she urged her views are many she had first to persuade lord stanley and this in personal interviews she succeeded in doing she begged him to open the subject to sir charles wood the secretary for india who did not take the suggestion amiss there were still however some contrary opinions but ultimately her policy prevailed i cannot help telling you in the joy of my heart she wrote to harriet martineau may nineteenth that the final meeting of the indian sanitary commission was held to-day that the report was signed and that after a very tough battle lasting three days to convince these people that a report was not self-executive our working commission was carried not quite in the original form proposed but in what may prove a better working form because grafted on what exists this is the dawn of a new day for india in sanitary things not only as regards our army but as regards the native population 
but miss nightingale was never content to let the light steal in gradually she wanted to secure for the report of the commission the fullest possible glare of publicity her first concern was to get early notices of the report in the newspapers the daring the celerity the energy of her moves might excite the admiration even of the greatest experts in this sort of our own day the gist of the report so far as its statement of the facts was concerned was contained in her own observations and as explained above she had already circulated these both in india and at home having thus as it were salted the ground she prepared for the official publication as one of the principal authors of the report she was obviously entitled to some copies she obtained a note from lord stanley the chairman to that effect the queen's printer mr spottiswood was her very good friend having been associated with her in more than one philanthropic enterprise and after seeing lord stanley's note he promised to use every expedition and to let miss nightingale have some of the very earliest copies she sent them off immediately to various influential friends sir john lawrence among the number but principally to writers for the press and with regard to these latter there was no reason why she should tell each recipient of the special early copy that he was not the only individual so favoured a blue book of two thousand twenty eight pages is not mastered in a minute and people wondered how so many of the newspapers and magazines were able to notice the report so fully on the instant mr baker the clerk to the commission has regained his equanimity wrote the printer july twenty three but for three days he could not recover the shock of your rapid action miss nightingale's celerity may well have seemed indecent to the leisurely official mind for six months were allowed to pass before the government of india was officially provided with copies of the report this delay may seem incredible to those not well versed in such affairs but it is recorded in a government dispatch and an investigation made by miss nightingale into another delay of a like kind may perhaps afford an explanation meanwhile in july eighteen sixty three she had for some days previous to the issue of the report been arranging for reviews in newspapers and magazines in edinburgh and dublin as well as in london mr w r gregg was especially helpful he contributed notices to three important periodicals the economist the national review and the spectator miss nightingale was diligent also in coaching harriet martineau writing at great length to explain the points on which public opinion might most usefully declare itself miss martineau wrote on the report in the daily news macmillan's magazine and once a week and on her own part she had a contribution to make to the cause she was an old friend of lord and lady elgin should she write to them the indefatigable miss nightingale at once sent her the heads of a letter on the subject which should go immediately to the viceroy though miss nightingale attached importance to notices in the press she was equally eager that the report itself should attract the attention of influential individuals in and out of parliament and here at the outset she met with a severe check which however by her energy and resource was turned to the greater advantage of the cause the blue books were of enormous bulk and a smaller edition had been prepared apparently by the clerk owing to what was officially described as a mistake it was this smaller edition that was presented to both houses of parliament by command it alone was placed on sale to the public the one thousand copies of the complete work of which the printer had been ordered to break up the type were reserved for the press and for official purposes they could be obtained on application by members of parliament but were not accessible to the public the smaller edition which the officials designed for public use did not contain miss nightingale's observations though these were referred to in the report and did not contain the evidence from the indian stations it gave instead a precis of evidence made by the clerk 
this as miss nightingale thought was badly done and moreover referred in the margin to passages which again were not accessible to the public miss nightingale was naturally and justly indignant at a proceeding which thus left the recommendations of the commission unsupported so far as the public were concerned by the essential facts she set herself with characteristic energy to rectify the official mistake or as she suspected to circumvent the design if indeed there were any intention to withhold from the public eye the full extent of the terrible state of things in india the authors of the design had counted without the formidable lady-in-chief as for the partial suppression of her own observations that was easily rectified dr sutherland and dr farr incensed at the treatment which she had received promptly made arrangements with the publisher for the separate issue of her observations this little red book had a large sale and was widely reviewed in the press thereby the subject received a second series of notices it is not a book said one of the reviewers but a great action but miss nightingale herself was more concerned with the wide circulation of the blue books themselves first she wrote round to every member of parliament whom she knew informing them of the facts and begging them to apply for the unmutilated edition one of the answers she received was from lord shaftesbury august twenty two i will immediately apply for the copy of evidence you mention but ought we not to insist when parliament meets that it be fully circulated like any other document sir c wood may have made a mistake but a far greater mistake would be to bury this important matter in the tomb of all the capulets you have achieved very grand things and you must thank god that he has called you to such a work and has so blessed it i have much to talk to you about secondly she extracted a promise that inquirers at hansard's office should be informed that copies of the unmutilated edition could be obtained by the public on application at the burial board office she took very good care that they should not be buried there she prompted all sorts and conditions of persons among her acquaintances to apply and there was a run on the book next and chiefly she was anxious that the essential parts of the report should come under the notice of every officer and every official in india who was in any degree responsible for the health of the army and who might be brought by a knowledge of the facts to further the cause of sanitary reform the way in which she achieved her purpose was characteristic miss nightingale had a personal grievance in this matter and she used it as on a previous occasion she had used her personal prestige to gain a public end to an intimate friend in the war office she was downright done in some way or other i am determined it shall be but to the great men above him she was suave insidiously and dangerously suave she entirely agreed that it would be expensive to reprint and absurd to circulate widely two enormous blue books of two thousand and twenty-eight pages nobody would read them but on the other hand was it not a little unfair to her to circulate an abridged edition from which was excluded all the material upon which at the request of the commission she had spent years of labour but what was to be done she knew how busy all government officials were but she would willingly undertake the task of putting together an amended edition of the smaller issue would the treasury object to the cost if so she would bear it in one way and another she said she had spent seven hundred pounds in connection with the former report on the british army the cost of similar work in connection with india would be less and she would gladly defray it lord de grey authorized her to proceed on august twenty sixth and for the next three months she was busy in preparing the report in the form in which it was to be circulated among military and medical officers but she was not quite satisfied yet she had provided means for bringing her horses to water but who was to make them drink her amended report was to be circulated amongst the army in india but would it be read 
she was afraid not unless the secretary of state specially commended it to the attention of his subordinates did the war office shrink from taking initiative in a matter which also concerned the india office but surely sir charles wood will be very grateful to you for remedying his mistake the minister assented and a preface was added to miss nightingale's edition of the report in which the secretary for war explained that it was circulated with a view of affording information on the subject to commanding engineering and medical officers of course there were official delays and this edition of the report was not issued till august eighteen sixty four but it gave miss nightingale opportunity of organizing yet another press crusade through sidney herbert's friend count Sreslecki, who was also a friend of delane she was able to secure a series of articles in the times on the sanitary needs of india the count was very proud of what he had been able to do for her none of miss nightingale's official works obtained a wider circulation than the observations nor i suppose did any blue book on such a subject ever attain a greater amount of publicity part six but all this was only a preliminary public attention had been aroused and every one said vaguely that something must be done it remained for government to do it the steps which miss nightingale took to this end the obstacles which she encountered the measure of success which she attained will be described in the next chapter the work which has been described in foregoing pages and which miss nightingale continued during the following year was very heavy and it was all done under grievous physical disability in eighteen fifty seven to fifty eight when she was doing like work in connection with the royal commission on the home army though she was in very delicate health she had yet been able to move about when sidney herbert could not come to see her she could go to see him but now in eighteen sixty three when work for the commission on the indian army was at its height she was bedridden when she invited a nursing friend to her house the formula was will you come and spend saturday to monday in bed with me she could only receive her visitors if at all in her own room and all her writing was done in bed she was sustained through these disabilities partly it may be by the consciousness of power and by satisfaction in its exercise but principally by passionate devotion to her cause and there was another feeling which gave her strength as appears from many a passage in her private letters she was carrying out as best she could alone the joint work which had been left unfinished at sidney herbert's death there is no feeling more sustaining sir john mcneill had said to her when arthur clough was also taken from her than that of being alone so in some sort i think she found it and sometimes as to one who stretches out his hands and yearning for the further shore there seemed to come to her voices of encouragement i heard the other day she said in eighteen sixty three of two englishmen who were nearly lost by being caught by the tide on the coast of france and a little french fisher girl ran all along the wet sands to show them the only rock half a mile from the shore which the tide did not cover where of course she was obliged to stay with them it got quite dark the water rose above their knees but presently they heard a sound faint and far off and the little girl said they think the tide is turning they are shouting to cheer us i often think i hear those on the far-off shore who are shouting to cheer me End of the province of the indian army continued sections four five and six part five chapter three of the life of florence nightingale volume two this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio. InterfaceAudio.com. The Life of Florence Nightingale, Volume 2, by Edward Tyus Cook. Chapter 3 
setting reformers to work 1863 to 1865 i am more hopeful than you appear to be in regard to the good likely to be affected by the report although our indian administration has great difficulties to contend with owing to the nature of the country and the people it is both honest and able and i never knew a public measure the advantage of which was generally admitted which ultimately was not properly taken in hand sir charles trevian letter to florence nightingale august twenty fourth eighteen sixty two in the last chapter we traced miss nightingale's hand throughout the famous report of the indian sanitary commission we saw how she worked for the inclusion in the commissioner's recommendations of machinery for getting the other recommendations adopted we saw too how cleverly she maneuvered to obtain wide publicity and discussion for the whole subject but this was not enough for her she had created a favorable atmosphere she had provided suitable machinery it remained to set the wheels going round Quote, reports are not self-executive she applied her words in this fresh direction and as in the case of the home commission five years before so now she gave not a moment's rest to herself or anybody else whom she could influence until reforms recommended by the report were set on foot miss nightingale was as eager in as great a hurry to begin as determined to have her way as before but the difficulties were now greater in the case of the home army only one department though that to be sure was a dual one was concerned in the case of sanitary measures for the army in india there were the india office and the government of india to be considered as well as the war office and everybody who knows anything about public affairs knows what it means to be the cause of prompt efficiency if departments begin wrangling with each other and then miss nightingale had no longer her dear master lord stanley the chairman of the indian commission was friendly and sincerely desirous to see things done but he was not an enthusiast his temperament was cool his judgment critical but as i have already said he had a great belief in miss nightingale and though she did not always find him an easy man to drive she did it the moment the report was signed she was up and at him he must do as sidney herbert did that is go at once to ministers and insist on immediate steps being taken to put the recommendations of the report into operation otherwise all their labor might dissolve in air lord stanley proposed to wait and see lord stanley to miss nightingale july tenth eighteen sixty three do not fear that lord herbert's work will be left unfinished sanitary ideas have taken root in the public mind and they cannot be treated as visionary the test of experience is conclusive the ground that has been gained cannot be lost again july twelfth the first step is to ask what the war and india departments will do if on consideration they consent to the appointment of the commissions recommended with or without modification of our plan the thing is fairly started i am inclined to believe that they will be found willing but we must give them time to read the report if they object to do anything other methods may be tried we have friends in the indian council and lord de grey is a sanitarist i quite agree in what you have to say as being a duty to help the ministry of the day in working out their plans practically i have acted on this rule few matters pass in the india office that do not come before me but such help cannot be offered by an outsider it must be asked by those who are responsible if sir c wood desires assistance in giving effect to the sanitary projects i will not refuse it there is ample time to consider all this so lord stanley was waiting to be asked then it became miss nightingale's business to contrive that he should be asked she saw lord de grey begged him to go forthwith to the india office and to suggest it to sir charles wood that he should talk matters over with lord stanley the thing was done 
lord stanley to miss nightingale july twenty fourth i have had several conversations with sir c wood and from the language he now holds i consider it settled that the report of the commissioners will be acted upon the w o commission being enlarged for the purpose of dealing with indian questions i have also arranged with him for the settlement of all personal claims arising out of our enquiry i hope therefore that we may look on our work as done for the present it is probable that difficulties will arise out of the conflicting claims of the indian and home authorities but these we must be prepared for and deal with as they come up so far all has gone well the duke of newcastle wrote to her to like effect august thirty first the report on the indian army is attracting much attention and i have no doubt it will do a great deal of good though there is supposed to be still a very strong obstructive power in the india office for a time it seemed as if official measures would be taken with reasonable celerity two members to represent india were added to the barrack and hospital improvement commission the secretary for india sent a dispatch august fifteenth suggesting the formation of sanitary commissions as recommended in the report miss nightingale was asked to draft a code of suggestions which might be sent out to india but soon there was a hitch the military element in the india office quarrelled with the report and it was intimated that there might be similar criticism from the military element in the government of india the accuracy of dr farr's statistics was to be impugned and it was to be objected that miss nightingale's observations did not in all cases reflect the present state of the indian stations as if reports which had been taken and must have taken months and months to collect could possibly have been brought up to the last moment and as if the mere fact that such reports had been called for was not likely to lead to some improvement these things need not detain us they were as miss nightingale put it the crimea over again these and those protesting that things were not so bad as they had been painted and that in any case it was not a who was to blame but b but meanwhile everything was hung up lord stanley the chairman of the commission whose report was impugned was in the country miss nightingale urged and baited him so she described it to come up to london and return to the charge he came in november and had an interview with her before seeing sir charles wood two and now an event occurred which was followed by results of consequence to her cause lord elgin the viceroy while travelling in the himalayas was stricken down by a heart complaint from which he was not expected to recover the question of a successor became urgent the minds of many turned to sir john lawrence but with one exception no indian civilian since warren hastings had permanently held the office of viceroy miss nightingale had unbounded admiration for him the soldier's heart in her loved his heroic deeds what would homer have been she once said if he had had such heroes as the lawrences to sing personal intercourse had filled her with closer admiration for what lord stanley called a certain heroic simplicity in the man for his unaffected piety his rugged honesty his deep sympathy with human suffering in later years a photograph of watts portrait of lawrence always hung in miss nightingale's room at the moment with which we are now concerned she regarded him as the indispensable man for india not more on account of the threatening border war on the northwest frontier the consideration which doubtless most moved lord palmerston than on account of his sympathy with the cause of sanitary reform an opportunity came for putting in her word sir charles wood consulted his predecessor at the india office and lord stanley in turn talked matters over with miss nightingale she urged him with fervent eagerness to do everything in his power to promote the appointment of sir john lawrence lord elgin died on november twentieth lawrence was appointed on november thirtieth and was to start for india immediately 
lord stanley to miss nightingale december first i saw sir c wood yesterday the sanitary question was gone into though not so fully as i could have wished sir j lawrence's appointment is a great step gained he knows what is wanted and has no prejudices in favor of the existing military administration i shall see him to-night and shall probably be able to have some talk with him on the subject but why should he not see you the plans are in the main yours no one can explain them better you have been in frequent correspondence with him i believe there will now be but little difficulty in india let me repeat you must manage to see sir john lawrence he does not go till the tenth your position in respect of this whole subject is so peculiar that advice from you will come with greater weight than any one else miss nightingale was among the first to offer congratulations to the new viceroy the terms in which she addressed him expressed what she sincerely and intensely believed miss nightingale to sir john lawrence among the multitude of affairs and congratulations which will be pouring in upon you there is no more fervent joy there are no stronger good wishes than those of one of the humblest of your servants for there is no greater position for usefulness under heaven than that of the government of the vast empire you saved for us and you are the only man to fill it so thought a statesman with whom i worked not daily but hourly for five years sidney herbert when the last appointment was made in the midst of your pressure pray think of us and of our sanitary things on which such millions of lives and health depend prompted by lord stanley miss nightingale asked the new viceroy to call he was the first of a succession of high indian officials who made a point of coming to miss nightingale before leaving for their posts the interview took place on december fourth miss nightingale never forgot either the interview itself or lord stanley's kindly anxiety that it should take place thirty years later february seventeenth eighteen ninety three in sending Aitchison's memoir of Lord Lawrence to Sir Harry Verney, she wrote, How many touches, short but sweet, I could add to the book. The real tale of Sir J. Lawrence's appointment as Viceroy will never be told. During the only ten days left to Lawrence before he started, he came to see me. How kind it was of Lord Stanley. He came like a footman to my door, and without giving his name, sent up to ask whether sir john lawrence was coming the interview was one never to be forgotten sir john lawrence discussed the sanitary question with miss nightingale in all its bearings and they exchanged views further by correspondence before he left london miss nightingale to dr farr december tenth i have had the great joy of being in constant communication with sir john lawrence and of receiving his commands to do what i had almost lost the hope of being allowed to do vis-a-vis -vis of sending out full statements and schemes of what we want the presidency commission to do i should be glad to submit to you copies of papers of mine which he desired me to write and which he took out with him as to the constitution of the presidency commissions if you care to see them they are of course confidential I have also seen Lord Stanley more than once during these busy days, and with Sir John Lawrence's command, we feel ourselves empowered to begin the Home Commission, and to further our plans upon it. Sir John Lawrence, so far from considering our report exaggerated, considers it under the mark. Thus was preparation made for putting the report into execution in India during lawrence's viceroyalty sir bartle frere was governor of bombay men used to say he told miss nightingale that they always knew when the viceroy had received a letter from florence nightingale it was like the ringing of a bell to call for sanitary progress three within a month of his arrival in india sir john lawrence had set the sanitary commissions on foot and nothing was wanting except hints and instructions from home 
Sir John Lawrence to Miss Nightingale, Calcutta, February 5, 1864. I write a line to say we have commenced work by establishing our sanitary committees for Calcutta, Madras, and Bombay. They are composed of five members. A civilian is at their head, and a medical officer as secretary. I hope that you will expedite the transmission of India of the codes and rules and plans, which have been approved of for home and the colonies. We shall then have an idea, in a practical shape, of the main features of the sanitary system, and can readily adapt it to the peculiar circumstances of the country. Without such a guide we shall often be perhaps working in direct opposition to your views. Where we differ it will become our duty to set forth the grounds for so doing, in sending our plans and reports home. Pray excuse the hurried scrawl, and believe me. Sincerely yours, John Lawrence. It was not Miss Nightingale's fault that this plea for expedition was necessary. In December 1863, Lord de Grey had again asked her to draft a letter to the India office, as from the War Office, on the measures recommended by the Royal Commission, and she had done it. But days, weeks, months passed, and nothing happened. In January 1864, her suggestions in regard to sanitary works required for the improvement of Indian stations, written at the urgent request of the Governor-General, were ready. Dr. Sutherland, Dr. Farr, and Mr. Rawlinson collaborating with her. Again, months passed and nothing happened. The Barrack and Hospital Improvement Committee had been officially informed in December of the appointment of the Indian members, and requested to report on any matters which might be referred to it by the Secretary of India or the Secretary for War, but as yet no Indian reference had been made. Miss Nightingale chafed sorely at the needless delay. The Governor-General wrote to her again and again, pressing for the suggestions. She had done her part long ago. The War Office had been in possession of her draft for months. She tried plain pressure, and pressure barbed with sarcasm. Poor man, she wrote in forwarding to the War Office one of the Governor-General's letters, March 10th. He really expects dispatch. He thinks we can write a letter in three months. He must be more fit for a lunatic asylum than for a Governor-Generalship or when the government had been having a close division in the house she tried to play the india office against the war office you will all be out this session she wrote to the war office march seventh eighteen sixty four after which i shall be able to get what i like from lord stanley i o but you will not be able to get what you like from general peel w o it is therefore very desirable that this letter be written now at once while you are still in it turned out that the reason of the delay was this the war office had sent a preliminary letter to the india office and the india office resented it sir charles wood it was explained to miss nightingale had snubbed lord de grey the war office was sulking in its tents accordingly the india office on its part was standing on its dignity and was not going to place itself in the humiliating position of taking action proposed to it by the war office and this was the reason why miss nightingale's suggestions for which the governor-general was asking were still pigeonholed as for minor recommendations in the royal commission's report it was quite true that many of them could be carried out by administrative order and some of them were but the difficulty in the case of others was that it had hitherto passed the wit of man to discover with whom the power or the responsibility of making the order lay well may miss nightingale have written as she did in more than one letter of this time january eighteen sixty four no impression in all my life was ever borne in upon me more strongly than this that the ministers have never considered the respective jurisdictions of the W.O. and the I.O., and that I.O., W.O., Horse Guards at Home, Commander-in-Chief in India, Governor-General in India, are as little defined as to the respective powers and duties as if India were the Sandwich Islands. 
on the major matter the dispatch of sanitary suggestions to guide their indian authorities miss nightingale now resolved that the delay should come to an end she had drafted an ultimatum to the war office threatening an attack in the house of commons when lord stanley a prominent member of the opposition appeared on the scene he had forewarned miss nightingale as we have heard that the departmental jealousies would cause some delay but seven months had now passed since the report of his commission had been issued and he seems to have thought that this was time enough to allow for the two offices to let off steam between themselves he wrote to miss nightingale suggesting that he should come to see her and offering if she approved to put pressure either upon lord de grey or upon sir charles wood miss nightingale loyally gave her friends at the war office a last chance but they did not care to take it lord stanley saw sir charles wood accordingly promised him parliamentary support in any action which he might take and matters were at last arranged miss nightingale's draft suggestions were submitted to the barrack and hospital improvement commission and with slight alterations were adopted by that body it was a war office commission but the dignity of the india office was consulted by the statement on the title page of the blue book that the suggestions had been prepared by the said commission Quote, in accordance with letters from the secretary of state for india in council unquote. the fact was that they were prepared by miss nightingale in accordance with the wishes of sir john lawrence when the suggestions had been passed officially it was within her power by the simple expedient of laying in a stock of early copies to prevent a moment's further delay she used the power and could not deny herself a few genial taunts at her official friends i beg to inform you she wrote to captain galton at the war office august eighth that by the first mail after signature i sent off h m s book post at an enormous expense i have a good mind to charge it to you to sir john lawrence direct no end of copies of suggestions also to the presidency commissions and that as he is always more ready to hear than you are to pray you sinners i have not the least doubt that they will be put in execution long before the india office has even begun to send them she was not far wrong six or seven weeks elapsed before the official copies were sent and meanwhile miss nightingale was able to get in another jibe she heard from sir john lawrence that he had ordered the suggestions to be reprinted in india it might be as well she wrote to the war office to hurry your copies for the india office who will otherwise receive them first from india end of section five part five chapter three setting reformers to work recording by lawrence trask interface audio dot com mount vernon ohio